saying all this time. Is that a nuts? Yeah. Are they? Yeah, hello. Wie geht's euch alle? Okay, cool. I don't think I said anything bad, did I? I mean, if I did, it won't be the first time. Okay, welcome to today's, uh, this afternoon's session on creative placemaking and opportunities for small towns and rural areas. My name is Encarnacion Toro, I'm with the Illinois Arts Council Agency, and I like to think of this session as creative placemaking opportunities for small towns and rural areas that you were afraid to touch and ask about. Mm -hmm. So today we have a uh, distinguished panel that are gonna expose everything there is about uh, creative placemaking. First we have Ben Fink, who is the lead coordinator of the Performing Our Future program at Apple Shop. Jessica Madika from the Freeport Art Museum, who is going to talk about her project around Freeport Civic Arts Plaza. We also have Donna, Worth, Donna Newworth from the Worm Farm Institute, and Pam Owens from the Gaylord Building Historical Site and National Trust for Historic Preservation. Ben? Oh, that's it. All right. So yeah, my name, my name is Ben Fink, and I open my mouth, and you immediately know that though I work in East Kentucky, I am in fact a self-described communist Jew from the Northeast. To, not technically true, because where is there a communist party worth joining these days? Um, the story of how I came to, oh, that's better. Story of how I came to Apple Shop is not doable within five minutes, but there's one important point in it, is that it wasn't my idea. I worked with some of the, those folks when they were in New York working on a 25-year-long collaboration with a Puerto Rican theater company in the Bronx, and they said, hey, we want to work with you. Are you interested in, in applying this position? So I, we were talking up here about the way I despise the term community engagement um, because it fe it's very... Um, it feels sort of patriarchal. Um, and in fact, I did not engage the community of East, in East Kentucky, the community engaged me. And what else, so the Apple Shop is um, short for the Appalachian Media Workshop, comes out of a bunch of young people trained by a government and American Film Institute program to help poor people learn a skill in the late 60s. And they said, okay, well we learned this skill, namely filmmaking, but we don't want to go get a job in, in Hollywood um, or whatever. We actually want to stay here, and we are inspired by the legacy of the civil rights movement and specifically the idea of I am somebody. We've got stories to tell. If you know anything about East Kentucky, you've probably seen the stories about Trump country this and Trump country that. Well, it was the same way in the 60s, uh, except it was about poverty tours um, and, and, and what we sometimes call poverty porn. So it's all right. How do we use this medium first of film, and then other people came doing theater. That's the part, That's I'm a theater artist. Um, I work for Roadside Theater, which is a part of Apple Shop. Then later started a community radio station and an archive and a youth media training program. And the whole point of it is, how do we, residents of a place with a long history of exploitation, timber, coal, now oil and gas, resource extraction, how to, and, and in order to justify exploitation, you always got a stereotype, right? Because you can't, take you can't take stuff away from people that are worthy, you need to civilize the dumbasses who would be totally helpless without you, um, and so you're just doing them a favor, right? And so, in order to resist exploitation, 
you've got to tell a different kind of story and not just tell it to yourself, but also make the kind of media that gets out there to the world and how do we tell a different story and then build a different future. I came there three years ago because this new thing came around called creative placemaking. Um, and suddenly there was all this money in it. And of course, a lot of people at Apple shop and saying, well, what the hell? We've been doing creative placemaking since 1969. Creative people in our communities telling a different story about ourselves and making a different future. But okay, now it's this big funding priority, so what do we do with it? And that is essentially the question I was hired to come and help figure out. I was the, the kind of basis of the work that I'm doing came from a consultancy with another institution that the community engaged, namely the Economic Empowerment and Global Learning Project at Lafayette College, led by this Jamaican economist named Flooney Hutchinson, total smartass, love him, and who looked at the work that Apple Shop did in turn and said, this is key for economic development. This is a guy who's worked with people I don't like, like the International Monetary Fund, um, and, but he says, okay, if you want to have sustainable economic growth, You've got to do it in a way where people's agency, voice, and ownership are encouraged and strengthened. And he said, what Apple Shop has the potential to do is function as what he called a culture hub, an organization that can catalyze a community's ability to exercise the agency, voice, and ownership necessary to catalyze the resources they've already got, you know, the, the, the skills and the talents, be it cooking or crafting or the, the deep cultural legacy of interdependence that leads us to be able to take care of ourselves, that interdependence, how can we turn that into community wealth? And I'm almost at the end of my time, so what I'll say is the handout that I gave you gives you a sense of how we started to do that. And so we first started building a county-wide network of organizations of, by, and for the communities that they were in. Um, working together to establish priorities and make things together, everything from reviving the oldest square dance in the state of Kentucky and in the process, that community's ability to lead, thank you, in, and to turn in people's skills in cooking into a catering company and brick oven bakery that's gotten national publicity. And so, and the way we work through culture, we start with that process a story circle, a community made play, a community documentary, and then we work w upward toward the stuff that you can actually make to develop together and downward toward a different story in the roots of how people understand each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have some images to share. Uh, my name is Jessica Modica. I'm with the Freeport Art Museum, as you know. And I'm here to talk a, a little bit about um, our creative um, placemaking um, and specifically the Civic Arts Plaza. Although the Civic Arts Plaza project, and I have a few um, slides here to show, um, is the largest creative placemaking project that um, we are currently doing. It is certainly not the only one, and it's certainly not where we started with this, um, working with this notion of creative placemaking. It really um, started with um, conversations that I was having within our institution about how we really needed to address growing our relevancy within our community. And um, I said one of the ways that we can look at um, increasing our relevancy is being a, a part of addressing the specific um, uh, problems or issues that our community um, is facing. And so just a, a couple words about our particular community. Freeport, uh, Illinois is in the northwest corner um, of Illinois. It's about 20 miles west of Rockford. Um, and about, I'd say, I think 30 miles um, east of Galena. So we're right in the middle between um, Galena and Rockford, kind of on the state line area. Um, we're a bit smaller than Galesburg, about 26,000 um, people and shrinking. So that's, you know, one of our, our issues. Um, and so one of the issues that our community is facing is a job loss. Um, the community has been bleeding jobs since the 1980s um, with the loss of major manufacturing. This is not uncommon, right, for a lot of rural towns across America. 
So our problems in that regard are not unique, um, but they are specific to our area. And then, so job loss, not only in manufacturing, but at one time, our community was once known as the um, insurance capital of the Midwest. Um, but um, those agencies also um, began to leave um, in the 90s and the early 2000s. And um, so we had, in our downtown area, um, we had a lot of uh, vacant buildings. And so one of the first ways that we started to look at um, creative placemaking was by doing um, pop-up shows. Uh, we were approached, the museum was approached on a number of occasions um, to do basically window dressings. Uh, people would come to us and say, we really need to look, make the downtown look better, and right? And so my response to that was, well, great, but let's take it just one step further and have people come into the space, not just go outside of the space and look at this window dressing. And um, so we did a couple of pop-up exhibitions um, in these spaces that, and it really invited people to come into a space where they haven't probably been in a while and just physically be in there and experience the space again. And the idea was to try and get um, people to start um, thinking about um, different ways that spaces could be used. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little, or s skip to some of our other um, creative placemaking. Um, these are kind of jumbled, and that's okay. Um, this is a great example of some of the things that then we started to do. Um, once people um, uh, started to realize that we were interested in, interested in being a part of the conversation, for the first time um, ever, uh, we began to be invited to sit around the conversation table. And that had never happened before. So all of a sudden, I'm sitting around a table with um, economic development folks, um, gov city government, um, council members, lawyers, other, you know, policy makers, and, um, and so forth. And I was always the token art lady. So for a long time, you know, they were very welcoming and, and very open to conversation, which was great. Um, but I did at first see a lot of like, scratching of the head and it's like, what is this art lady doing here? You know, what is she um, contributing? But we started to do more of these types of activities. This is one, it's a program that we do called Artivation. It's in the summer. And one of the other issues in our, uh, in our community is um, an issue of education. Our education system has some real problems. And so Artivation was created um, to prevent what's known as um, summer slide or summer learning loss. But at the same time, we're using our um, space um, downtown that we have as uh, a display space, so bringing it out in, into the community um, in a more, a much more uh, visual manner. So as a result of these conversations um, that we, we had, um, we, uh, one of the resources that we had available to contribute is a parcel of land in the heart of our downtown that was given to us many years ago with the intent of um, building a new building. Well, we did a feasibility study, and that feasibility study basically revealed you're not building a new building <laughs> in the downtown area. So it just sat there. And, um, and then people started to use it, um, either with or without letting us know that they are using it. And um, so that kind of signaled to us that people needed a civic space. They needed a space um, for them to use and um, for festivals, for ga a gathering space. And that's really where the idea was born um, for the Arts um, Plaza. And that's now where I can just zip through some slides really quick. Um, so these are the design renderings for the space. Um, and the space, it will be very much art-centered. It includes a multi-purpose stage. Um, let's see if I've got a slide of that. Here, um, and in the front of it um, is a splash pad. Um, currently, there's no um, public space in this area in our town, and the splash pad would provide a, a great activity, free activity um, for families to participate in. And then there's several areas, and I know my time is probably yeah. over. <laughs> okay, um, I can get into that in detail in the question and answer um, period as far as what the space itself will be comprised of. But. Um, oh, 
All righty. So it's the this button. Okay. Yep. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Donna Newworth, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Worm Farm Institute. We are based in rural Reedsburg, Wisconsin, which is exactly halfway between Chicago and Minneapolis. And I'm um, happy to be back in Illinois. I actually went to school here and lived in Chicago for 15 years, so feel very much at home here. Um, so our work at the Worm Farm is to integrate culture and agriculture along the rural-urban continuum. And it started, this is our farm, uh, it started in 2000 with an artist residency program, which is still going on. So for the past 18 years, uh, we have what is not a retreat, but rather an engagement in the life of a working farm. Um, oh, I didn't include that one. Um, so artists come from across the country and occasionally other countries for anywhere from two, two weeks to six months to um, hang out on the farm and spend time in the garden every morning for three hours and then the rest of the time is their own. They have studios in the barn and it's very much an engagement in the life of a working organic vegetable farm. Uh, so many years of that back and forth with artists uh, coming to sort of remind us how excited we were. Jay and I, that who founded the Worm Farm, were formerly from Chicago, so city people who really had no idea how to grow food, no appreciation for the work and the joys uh, that come out of it. So that was very much a part of our residency program and led us to several other projects that were much more public. And I'm mainly going to talk about, this is the artists in the garden, and um, I'm going to talk about our largest program, which is called Fermentation Fest, a live culture convergence. Uh, and we call it a live culture convergence because it's about live culture in all its forms, everything from dance to yogurt and poetry to sauerkraut. So we've just completed just last weekend, and I'm still a little bleary-eyed, um, about 50 classes and workshops on how to ferment almost anything you can imagine, including chocolate and coffee. Most people don't realize are fermented. Uh, and those takes place in downtown Reedsburg, population 9,000. And when we started this in 2011, there were many vacant storefronts, again, or underutilized places, and so we would locate the classes in these underutilized or empty spots. Uh, they're getting harder and harder to find every year. Um, and so, but the biggest part of the live culture convergence is the farm art detour. And it is a 50 mile self-guided drive through scenic working farmland of Sauk County, and I think you all have maps, um, punctuated by temporary art installations like this one here, and pasture performances, and what we call food chain, which are two stops along the map where um, there are food trucks and we call it a, a marketplace of food, art, and ideas. So I'm gonna show you various art installations. And pasture performances, these are free and they take place uh, in fields. And these are called field notes. And so we have about 10 of these that explain anything from hay to corn to dairy to ethics. Uh, and this is a work from a, a Wisconsin artist. This is a three quarter mile long clothesline. And uh, the clothes were collected through area churches and then they were color coordinated. And so they were either placed um, along the color that they already were or many of them were dyed. And, uh, and then afterwards they were delivered to folks who wanted to take the clothes home with them. Um, so they vary and uh, some are very kind of engagement oriented and some are just beautiful objects in the field. Um, but it's all about the land. So this is a 50 mile ride, but uh, there were about 40 stops along that, that experience and so mostly what you see is what farmers, the artistry of what farmers do every day and that's really the point. Uh, so when you bring people along with a map and they're dedicated to looking for the next stop on the map, it brings about a certain kind of awareness and sharpens people's focus and they also focus on the other things that are not, not necessarily um, depicted on the map. Uh, and this has been a uh, 
uh, an amazing experience. It's grown every year. It was up to about 22,000 in 2016, and it got a little bit too big to manage. So we have shifted the detour to a biennial, and we just brought it back this year, the first year in our biennial plan. And so we are rethinking this. Um, along the lines of fermentation fest. Fermentation is about abundance and transformation. And so we're dealing with abundance, whether it's from grain to beer, or from milk to cheese, or from cabbage to kimchi, or from one sort of community to another. And the abundance um, either can be captured and harnessed and planned for, or it can turn into foul slime. And so that's what the project is about. Uh, this is another artist um, who who borrowed this tractor from a farmer, a working tractor, and encased it in firewood. And then after this, it's only up for 10 days and everything comes down. And after the 10 day period, returned the firewood to uh, area farmers, area families who heat with wood. And so every one of these, whether it's a field note or a food chain stop or an art installation, is done in collaboration with local farmers. And so from the beginning, we had to approach farmers and say, can we do this art thing in your field, in your hay field? And the year one, we, had, we didn't have these pictures to show them. So we had a couple of early adopter farmers who said, well, what could it hurt, why not? And a, one of them um, owned the property where this particular installation was. This is called Ruminant, the Grand Masticator. And the artist from Minnesota made this uh, with stained glass panels on a combine whose destiny was to go to a combine demo derby. And his plan was to reclaim those stained glass panels and take them back with him and sell them or do, do whatever he chose. It was his work of art. But a group of community members came together, including the landowner, uh, who is a Trump voter, Republican, um, a longtime resident of this community. And they raised $40,000 uh, for this piece to become permanent public art in downtown Reedsburg. Uh, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pam Owens. I'm the executive director of the Gaylord Building. Um, we're located, we're a site of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and we're located in Lockport, Illinois, which is about 20 miles outside of Chicago. And I'm, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. I think you know, where we want to start is, you know, we did um, our a recent, over the past few months, and is actually still ongoing, we had an event on Saturday night, a summer art series called Unlock. And our goal with this program there's the Gaylord Building. I know I have a slide here that explains a little bit more about our program. Um, first of all, let, let's back it up and talk about the Gaylord Building just briefly. As you can see, in the 1980s, um, our site was in just fallen in disrepair. And as well as most of downtown Lockport looked a lot like this. And thankfully, some um, community leaders got together and um, connected uh, um, this building to the Donnelly family, which has a history of ownership of this site from years and years ago in the 1800s. And um, the building was renovated. And this is what it looks like today. And it, really, the building has been this barometer throughout the history of Lockport about the health of, of downtown. When the Gaylord Building has been in disrepair, downtown has, has been in decline or was on hard times. And the Gaylord Building has really been that um, economic engine. And my background is downtown economic development. I am, I'm not a person who has um, a history or even an art background. So, But I have spent in mo most of my career in working in communities. Um, I worked for the city of Moline as the Main Street director for quite a long time before I, I moved to take this position in Lockport. And so I, I, I understood a little bit about what, um, what people want from a downtown. It's very experiential. And while communities are saying, where are our stores? We need a department store. We need a drug store. That is really not the key to a successful downtown. It's really about activating the space and getting people to see downtown as, as a, a civic treasure that's valuable to the community. I really can't even see this. Anyway, just to explain what our program was, um, we, our goal was to connect our historic site to the downtown and utilize art to do that. Um, when I came on board three years ago, the building was you know, literally vacant. The one thing that was working in our building at that time was a local theater group. And they were selling out their shows while 
our board of directors was encouraging me to do dinner lectures that were selling about 10 tickets per lecture. Um, it really took about a year and a half of strategic planning and working with our board for them to really understand that we, in, we, need, we wanted to increase diversity at our site, both in um, ethnic diversity, but also in age diversity. Because our, our audience that was coming to our events at the Gaylord Building was I felt young, and I'm not young. So it was a definitely an over 60s crowd, and we were really looking to in, in increase engagement throughout the community and for our site to be something that the community on all levels was attending. So we came up with a program called Unlock, where um, utilizing funds that we received through the National Endowment for the Arts, um, our town program, we decided to have a program where we would use a juried selection um, and select 10 artists. And those artists would um, create artwork that represented the history of Lockport as it's told through art today. And that the artworks would not be located within our building, but that we would have those artworks placed um, throughout downtown and that each one of those artists <clears throat> would also plan a community engagement activity as part of that program. And it was, um, it was really a heavy lift having um, 10 artists come in and do the creative process over a relatively short period of time. Our artworks were extraordinarily diverse. I have some images of them. Um, and as you can see, we had a lot of partners who were on board for this type of program. I think the thing that was um, Extraordinary to me, and I'm all about metrics and reporting back to my board on how can we say something is successful. And when I look at um, what was invested, the $50,000 from the National Endowment for the Arts, we were able to engage community, um, community um, other organizations throughout the community and other funds throughout the community um, to implement a $200,000 arts program in the community over the past summer. Um, these are some examples of some of the in-kind services that were provided to us. These were created by the city of Lockport. And this will um, be some images here showing our artists. This is Sam Love who did a Lockport poetry project. He did 12 poetry workshops all over town. And one of the things that just you know, organically grew out of this is that he um, did some word poetry of, of some of the poems that were created during the workshops. And this is in um, a walking path underpass uh, under a very, very busy road and um, right along the, the canal path uh, um, leading from the Gaylord Building to the Illinois State Museum Lockport Gallery. It was really stunning and it's so much fun to see people just stop and read poetry as they're walking along. Oh, this one isn't turning out very well. This was um, an installation called Harvest, which was wheat stalks. This was um, a local artist who, who captured some of the architectural details throughout downtown and then um, created a scavenger hunt. So it really helped drive traffic through the doors of the businesses. Because if you wanted to vote to win one of the paintings, you had to go and place your ballot inside of a business. Um, this was a a mural artist who did a mural in the lobby of the Gaylord Building. This was another mural that went up um, in the, the Lockport Library. And what was really, this is a great project here where the artist outlined this and then set up 15 minute painting sessions with the community. So it really was um, actually painted by the community. He did a lot of touch up afterwards but, and did a lot of guiding. But you know, this is one of those projects where the community really did, does feel an ownership for this project. There's another mural that's going up. Um, you can see it looks like trucks are parked there, but they're not. That's part of the mural on site of a very ugly concrete block building, and it's about 86 feet long. This was um, a project that was along the canal where you can see this artist has um, utilized water as a generating station for solar panels and um, growing plant materials. And this is a paper artist who did um, artwork that is naturally sourced plant materials from alongside the I&M Canal and Garden in the Sky where these are solar orbs that connect about a mile along the canal that they're still up, they're going to be down soon, but it's been really a stunning project. And this is Dolomite to Dol Dolobite where we had a cryptocurrency created in Lockport that the community could 
engage in purchasing a Lockport specific cryptocurrency and buy items from downtown businesses. So that was really cool. Where you could you had to buy the cryptocurrency and you could go in and um, get a drink at a bar, or buy a t-shirt or get a pizza. So there were lots of ways that the art was engaging the community to actually support the downtown businesses. Okay, great. So we've heard a variety of different examples of uh, creative placemaking projects. I was just going to ask a couple questions and engage the panel in a little conversation, and then we're going to open it up for some questions and answer uh, time uh, at the end of the session. So I have just a basic uh, first question for all of you, and, and that is, what is creative placemaking for, for you? And, and or, what are key components in creative placemaking for you? It's open to everyone. Going in order? Doesn't Don't have to. Um, I, I happen to write my definition down because at, at the beginning when we first got our first Our Town grant, we again were doing creative placemaking before we had a term for it and so we needed to make it our own. So this is our definition. Creative placemaking is an active process that illuminates existing assets and re-enchants the familiar, amplifying what is while building soil for what might be. With an arts emphasis, diverse partners engage in serious yet playful rediscovery of a place rich with, with history, idiosyncrasy, and possibility, a place too important to leave alone. Pam? I think one of the things that, and when we were looking at what creative placemaking meant for, placemaking meant for us at our historic site is, um, we were really looking at, at a downtown that, that needed our assistance and, um, you know, we, we could be like an island and do our own arts programming and bring an audience into our building, but what we were really looking at doing was working together with our downtown businesses to have them embrace our program and there were a lot of offshoot where um, a lot of, of the downtown businesses were doing um, what I would call, you know, sort of satellite programming that was very complementary to ours. So for, for, for us, you know, that was our goal was um, doing our programming, but not doing it in a way that was simply um, elevating our historic site, but um, bringing value to the community as a whole and bringing in people in a way that, um, that they were exploring all of the artwork that was placed around rather than just driving traffic through the own door, our own doors. Great, Ben. I'll be a stereotypical Northeastern left-leaning Jew and quote Tom Lehrer in his song about Werner von Braun. He said, don't say that he's hypocritical, say rather that he's apolitical. That's a bit how I feel about creative placemaking. As a term, the only definition, it's art plus development, right? I think that's the only, ter the only definition I know that defines it all the ways that it's used, which can be the animating of spaces and people taking control of their destiny through their traditions and, and creating an equitable future, or it can be a developer and a government works with some artists um, and other elites of the town, uh, so artists at the table, they join the elites in creating art that essentially kicks people out of their place and makes them not belong. And I was a panelist last year on NEAR Town grants, and I gotta say, I saw a lot more of the latter than I saw of the former. And so it's a term that, again, definition, art plus development. Um, but I'm not necessarily sure, it, uh, in fact, I am sure it is neither intrinsically a good thing or a bad thing. And it's really the way we do it and the values we bring to it. In the packet that I made, you'll see this is the way we have, the values we've brought to it. And our practice, which we generally don't call creative placemaking, but others do, and that's fine, um, is that triangle on the third page of the handout, which is building a combined practice of grassroots cultural work where people in 
communities, especially historically exploited communities, tell our own story, combined with broad-based community organizing, where we build our own power, combined with community wealth creation, where we discover um, and catalyze and act on the value that we got in our community toward a future where we own what we make. And to me, that's creative placemaking as it should be. Creative placemaking as it is, art plus development. Well, you know, I don't think I have a hard and fast definition of creative placemaking, but what I do have is the way that we have been using um, creative placemaking. And if I could borrow the clicker back, just I'd like to go back um, to my slides real quick. Um, we have been using um, creative placemaking. Um, woo, fast, stop. Oh, you're, going, you're helping me, thank you. <laughs> I was like, wait, what am I doing? <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so, you know, we're a community that had really kind of lost its sense of, of place. Um, and so we were util we've been utilizing the arts to um, recreate um, our downtown, uh, recreate our spaces, um, and have people start to come back town, back downtown uh, more often um, to come together to enjoy making something um, creative. Um, so, for example, one of the things I didn't talk about before was this project called Paint the Port. Um, and so it's a little bit of both of these things. It's a little bit of development and um, a little bit of revitalization and a lot of this um, making sense of our space again. So it takes place along um, a downtown street, Chicago Avenue, and it just so happens that's the uh, street that our city would love to um, create a, a, a cultural corridor. Um, so again, we're partnering with our city as far as being a part of that um, in, or informing that desire to create this um, cultural corridor. But essentially, it's, it's a community-wide um, street paint party. And um, it invites everybody to come downtown and paint a four-by-four four square along the street. They pay a little bit of money that pays for the expense um, but then we raise money. There's a fundraising mechanism involved in Paint the Port, and um, it raises about $10,000. And the city matches that $2 for every one of our dollar raise. So we had $30,000 to... In your city. <laughs> well, that is very unusual. Yeah, it's great. It's very unusual. Um, I, was, I was very pleasantly surprised um, when, they, when the city decided to do that. So we had a, a pocket of $30,000 that we used to reestablish and refund a facade improvement program um, that had been defunded uh, a few years prior. So, you know, after the first year, we, and then we saw the results of um, these projects, these facade improvement projects. Um, take place, and so this now we're in our second year, and so there's there's a little bit of both all of those things being inter kind of interwoven um, together for us. Does, that uh, does anyone have any uh, additional comments they want to add to that? Quickly, I think there's in terms of rural creative placemaking in particular. We were talking about this, Donna, and Enunciacion? Enunciacion. Encarnacion, excuse me, I apologize. Um, we were talking about this before, that so often rural creative placemaking practices are assumed to be, well, you take the urban practices and you find the downtowns in the rural areas and you do the same things there. Um, and so the problem with that, of course, is that there's a lot of rural America that's not in the downtowns, right? Whitesburg, um, the town where Apple Shop is in, has got 2,000 people in it. Letcher County, where um, our home county has got 22,000 people. And so, so often when you're just using these urban planning paradigms, it's about, biz that's about um, you know, storefront businesses and land development, and et cetera, it doesn't compute to the people living in the hills and the hollers um, and on the farms. And so I think it's important, and I'll, I'll never say that the buildings aren't important, but when that becomes the definition of creative placemaking, that's a problem, which is why so much of the work that we do is about 
people telling stories together in the places where they are currently organized. So, okay, you got a, you got a rural area. Where do people come together? Sometimes they come together in a church. Sometimes they come together in a community center. Sometimes they come together, we were surprised to learn, in a volunteer fire department that also focuses you know, not just on public safety, but also as a place where people to gather to make art and play music and all that stuff. And so to do creative placemaking in a place that is not a downtown, you gotta find where people do gather then work with the leadership there, which is not necessarily the people you know, with the titles, but the people who their neighbors turn to, um, and say, how, what's going on here, and how can we collaborate? Which requires that it's not you know, all our ideas, us the nonprofit with the big grant, um, but actually how are we gonna partner together and increase what is already going on here, um, and th in a way where a whole community can tell its story and then act on it. To add a little bit to that, is it on? Yep. Okay. Um, we sometimes call what we do is uh, linked placemaking because the 50 mile drive goes through four little tiny towns and then begins and ends in the town of Reedsburg where we are, our offices are located. So then we are all involved in this uh, 10 day project and uh, we're inviting to people to, to take this trip and go to all the five uh, towns. And so those towns on their own recognize opportunities that when thousands of people are driving around and slowing down that they may be able to uh, capitalize on that and so some have. Um, and so, and those places, those small towns do have a bar, usually, it's Wisconsin, um, and sometimes a gas station and a church, and those places are the places where people gather, and then maybe they do a little bit more, but it is, it, it, I think building on existing assets is the one thing that I think creative placemaking does stress. Don't build it and they will come. No, you right. recognize what's there, what could be amplified and better used, and then you do stuff to bring people there. That's a great segue into the next question. All of you have, uh, in describing your projects, all of you have talked about partnerships and, and uh, talked about a place. <laughs> um, but I was wondering if you could expand on what kind of key components were essential to your projects. We know that one is a place, two is the, the uh, people, but uh, what other kinds of things do you feel are, are uh, key to developing place-making projects? Is it bringing in stakeholders? What kinds of partnerships? Asset uh, assessment maps? Or what are key components in, in that you see for, for uh, developing creative place-making? I think with our Unlock program, the one of the things that was um, really a key component to us was the partnerships that we had, and I, and I don't mean just financial, but it was really having the Artist Guild of Lockport or Gallery 7, which is also located in Lockport, and the Illinois State Museum, that when, when we were putting together, say, information on a promotion about an upcoming artist event, it wasn't just us reaching out to our regular audience but really just a sharing of information so that, um, you know, it wasn't just going out to say that, you know, 700 people on our list, but going out to 700 here and here and here that may be people who um, would not normally hear about any of the programming that we were doing. And very, very little of our budget was spent on marketing, but so that really was really key because we were paying the artists for their work and, um, and the supplies to create that artwork. So the key really for us was, um, utilizing partnerships for the promotion because that really you know the the, the artwork while it's beautiful our our goal was to um, really bring people into the community and um, stay to to create a, a, a corridor where the artwork was connecting a lot of locations and resources throughout the community so that people were coming and and spending the day and then giving them a reason to keep coming back We worked with the county, Salt County, from the beginning. Um, we are very fortunate to be in the only rural county in the state of Wisconsin, which, by the way, is 48th in funding for the arts, so we're way, way down there. 
uh, but our county has a small grants um, program for arts and humanities, and the only other two counties in the state are Madison, uh, Dane County, and Milwaukee. So we were in a really great position to be able to do these small things, get funding and leverage that funding for more, and that's what we did over, over many, many, many years. And, uh, and then when your project gets outside attention and then brings in more money to the county, then people pay attention. <laughs> so um, we were able to, to um, convince the county board, and we have 32 people on our county board, which I guess is very unusual. Um, so after three years of the, of the growth of this, organ, of this um, event, which is, I mean, agri if you had to call it something, you'd probably call it agritourism. And so there's many entry points into it uh, for, for people's interest. And, but from the county's perspective, they were very happy that we were pointing out some of the, the gems within the county, Devil's Lake, uh, American Players Theater, Taliesin, Frank Lloyd Wright's home. So we were able to sort of knit together all these assets that are always there, uh, but invite people from, from further away to come and use the excuse of this 10-day tour to get deeper, to, to basically an invitation to come and take a closer look. For us, a lot of it was this incredible timing, um, to be truthful. Um, within our, our community, there were several groups that were really coming together to create a lot of change, um, much needed change. And so there was one group that was um, working on remarketing the entire city. And there was another group that was um, working on changing the way that we do city government. Um, and they did get that changed. We now have a city manager. And then there was our group, too, that was working on um, creative placemaking, but also kind of as far as um, uh, downtown revitalization specifically. And uh, so th that all of those things were working at the same time that we were working on um, this idea. And so that the timing was kind of, it was very crucial. Um, and then when we received the NEA um, Our Town Award, um, that uh, money really did allow us to leverage um, those funds because um, as often happens, when people hear that your project has uh, this award, um, that uh, lends a great deal of um, legitimacy um, to your project. Like, oh, you know, the NEA uh, believes in your project, um, and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, after the announcement of that award, a private funder came forward with $250,000, um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, we received another um, gift of $250,000. So, you know, that has really allowed um, this project uh, for, the, for the plaza space um, to move forward um, much on a much more um, uh, fast timeline uh, than we anticipated to. Oh, yes. Thank you for getting me back. We have multiple mics. The word that Donna used before I think is really important, and the word is amplify. Right? A lot of times, in my opinion, misled creative placemaking efforts talk about we're going to give the community a voice. Well, how patronizing is that? People are talking. The problem is they're not always heard. And so what we do through film and theater and media and radio and news production and all sorts of other media is to amplify that voice so that they can be heard by each other, they can be heard by people outside, and they can be heard in many ways you know, by themselves. And so, so, and so that's one, two verbs really exemplify our practice. One is amplify, and then the other is catalyze. So a catalyst is party to a reaction, but it is not involved in the reaction. More, more chemistry analogies after um, fermentation. And so but what that looks like is creating the conditions for different people, leaders, organizations, communities to come together. So that's in that second page of the handout, this notion of the process is where we plant that seed um, and we, through creating the conditions for different people, groups, entities to come together, 
they can recognize that they've got common interests, common values, common dreams, common stories, even when they don't think they do, even when they voted for a different person, even when they've been told that their community is historically opposed to that community or their family is opposed to that community. Through creating the conditions, through making these spaces, we can catalyze a different kind of partnership. And the last few pages in the handout are three basic methods that we use to do that, which you might be familiar with, and you might be familiar with in a little different way than how we do them. I won't go into the details, but the point is, yes, partnerships, absolutely partnerships, but real serious equitable partnerships in mutual interest take work, and they take ongoing work, and they take creative work. So the story circle, the last of the three methods, which was created by Apple Shop Roadside Theater in collaboration with the Free Southern Theater, the theater wing of SNCC and the Civil Rights Movement, has always been a creative process for making plays and has always been an organizing process for a community telling its, its, its story even when people don't necessarily, people in power don't always want to hear it. And then the last thing I'll say is that those partnerships, it's important to have them at all levels. So the Letcher County Culture Hub is 20 different communities within Letcher County. That, you know, I was once called, I was working in a town about 20 minutes outside of Whitesburg, a town of about 200, um, and they called me an outsider, not because I'm from Connecticut, but because I'm from Whitesburg, half hour away. Happens all the time, and it's not innocent. It's the way people, the people in Letcher County have been set against each other so that they are not unifying against the people taking all of their land and labor and resources away from them. Likewise, nationally, we have always worked hyper-locally and hyper-nationally as well, and so Worm Farm and Apple Shop are two partners in a national project called Performing Our Future, which is doing exactly that same kind of work, but on a national scale. People from north, south, people from urban, rural, people from majority black and majority white and majority indigenous communities who have long been set against each other by some of the same forces for some of the same reasons, coming together in these spaces and catalyzing relationships among them and work that is in mutual interest. I just want to check in with you guys to see if anyone has any questions. Okay, there's one in the back. Well, first of all, I, I want to know where you're from. I, I grew up in Orion. Uh, Landonville, no, so I'm from close to Galesburg, <laughs> too. <laughs> um, so we, we did. We had 10 artists. And I'll, I'll break it down and, and let you know how that works, because we did. We, had a, a, we, we did a nationwide search. We utilized Submittable um, and put out an RFQ or RFP. And we had about, um, it, while we were selecting 10 artists, we had um, close to 40 submissions. And we had a jury um, 
of, of both local and um, I had someone from the National Trust who had worked on a lot of NEA programming and someone from the Art Institute on our jury. So we did our, you know, our first round was a yes, no, maybe online vote. And then we got all of the jurors together in a room and if they couldn't be there, we were able to do kind of a, a web meeting with them so that they could, we could all review the images that had been submitted to us. Um, the way that each of the 10 artists were paid was they each received $2,500 with a, a $700 stipend for supplies. So that meant if they were traveling, um, that expense was on them. Um, that was part of our, our um, submittal process is that we made that very clear um, that you know, that they had to be on site to, to do one program. So they, they could have come and they could have, you know, created their art based on um, a lot of resources that we provided to them online about the community and the history of the area, the i and Canal. So there were a lot of resources for the creative process that they could have gotten without being on site. Most did choose to come and be on site. Uh, we held an information day for artists in January, and then the creative process actually began, um, you know, sometime after they had um, determined and had their project approved. We did not not approve any projects. But we did, you know, we had one artist who was in town for six weeks, and that was quite a burden on him because he was doing, uh, it was the, the outdoor sculpture along the canal with the solar panels. And interestingly enough, he was... Um, attempting to get tenure at, at the university where he taught. So he really was looking at this as something that was going to help propel his career forward. Um, he, he did a combination of things where, you know, he put himself up in hotels. We did reach out. Um, he was willing to just take a room somewhere. We really couldn't find a place for him to stay that was cost effective. But we did have a couple of community members that um, let him crash every now and then or go in and take a shower. And so, you know, it really was um, up to the artist. Um, we had two artists who were the, the paper artists were from Rhode Island. And um, they, they really created most of their artwork prior to coming into the community. And they came in during a very large festival weekend and they stayed in hotels and um, did their workshops that weekend and then they were gone. So, you know, with each artist, we really did work with them to try to make it work as best we could so that um, they could participate in the program. And really, we were, we were wanting to bring in outsiders for this program as well as highlight, you know, the artists that we had within, the own, with our, within our own community. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit about our process. All the detour artists, uh, we also use an RFP process with a jury, and we're looking for a site responsive work. So we use a two-step process, and the jury meets once and, and selects uh, about 16 finalists. We pay their way to come and stay uh, for the weekend, and they are put up by local families very willingly. And uh, then we drive around the detour, they meet some of the farmers, they meet former artists who've been in, in, uh, involved in the project before, they learn more about our impulses and, and what we're looking for, and then they have three weeks to further develop their project. So the first part of it is, is, is kind of sketchy, and then the second part is much more site responsive. We give them a small stipend to complete the second um, pro project, and then the jury meets again and selects depending on how much money we have, um, six to eight uh, um, to be realized. And those are also, if they come from, from far distances, we find homestays for them. And some of the people who, who have put up artists want to do it again and again and again. And in fact, one of the artists who used to live in Washington, D.C., applied uh, twice. It was selected twice. And now he moved here. He actually bought a house and moved. <laughs> and he hosted one of the artists this year who came from France. So I think involving the community in those relationships and seeing those ideas become realized and having a stake in that, I can't say enough about it. Um, the artists get $5,000 each. Uh, although this changes from year to year, we actually have two um, categories, 2,500 and 5,000, and we ask them to pick their own. That We're not going to do that again, <laughs> because everybody, of course, picks five. And we could do more if we had a couple at 2,500. So we, we're going to have to revisit that. But, um, and all their travel to get there is included in that. And so the, the artists from France 
got himself there as part of uh, his five thousand dollars. Question over here. Oh, we do that in a variety of ways, and it changes every year. We try to get better and better. We have a very small staff and, and rely heavily on volunteers, so we don't do as much as we would like. Um, to track numbers, we do it in a variety of ways. We try to make everybody start at the Chamber of Commerce. If you look at the map, we say start here, buy a map, start here, and then they're very good at counting everyone. And then we have what we call intercept surveys at two of the food chain stops where, where people will often gather and have something to eat. And then one of the questions is, where did you start? Did you start at the chamber? And so we kind of triangulate maybe four out of, one out of four starts at the chamber. So we take that number. We also have car counters to, to count the wheels in certain places. And we also, certain businesses, um, again, these are small towns and very small businesses. We don't ask them to report their sales because it's cash businesses. You know, we know, we understand that. But we want them to tell us anecdotally what their experience has been. And so we, we have them say uh, what percentage increase over the average 10-day period. And so we've had people say anywhere from 10% to 800%. Um, and then the more, the more active those businesses are in reaching the audience, um, for example, they've learned that if they have a vegetarian option, they'll do well. <laughs> and so, so if they're responsive and they care and they pay attention, they can really capitalize on that audience. Some don't. Um, and there's also pop-up garage sales and estate sales of people that sort of respond. So we take note of all those things. And one of the things that has happened over the years is that there's the, the paid artists and then there's the farmers who create the, the wealth image at the beginning, at the end was created by landowners and farmers. Uh, and they do that at their own expense. Uh, and so we track how many of those happen, and then there's also something that we don't know, um, things just show up, and we call them rogue installations. And so we count those because they're a, a creative um, response, uh, and so we count those, we count the garage sales, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, boy, we, we try to do all, about the, the funding, does the funding cover um, the sponsors? Well, we wish we could have admission. It's hard to have admission to a 50-mile self-guided drive. But yes, one of the ways we do is we sell the maps. The maps cost $5. Um, we, we have a couple of performances that are ticketed, but the experience of taking the detour is absolutely free of charge, and that is underwritten by our funders who, for whom that is an important uh, thing that we are offering. We're offering free cultural programming to thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and, but we need to increase our earned income because the, the larger grants, as some of you may know, don't last forever, and so um, shifting to a biennial was also part of the plan to sort of rethink how we can um, make it last or how it can transform into the next best thing. Uh, because a number of these questions have been revolving around finances, I'm just going to ask you some questions about your resources. How many of you have received an NEA grant to support your project? How many have, of you have received other federal sources to support your project? What was that? We've gotten funding for, from the National Endowment for the Humanities for several archive-based projects. Uh, we run a regional archive as part of the Apple Shop as one of our divisions. Um, it's actually sev several of those. Our radio station is supported partially by the, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And we have done some work in workforce development that's been supported by the Economic Development Administration. Okay, and how many of you have received funding from your state government, either through a local arts agency or other source? Yeah. Yeah. How many have, of you have received funding from your municipality, be it, uh, be it uh, your city or your county? 
Okay. How many of you receive funding from? We've got to be down there somewhere in terms of uh, local support with Wisconsin, but um, yeah, that's yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question specifically. What um, funding for the arts on a state by state level? We're oh, 48. I, we're we're right in the middle, okay. actually. But we went through uh, two years. Uh, uh, in the last three years, the two years uh, previous to this last year, we had no state budget. Not only the arts council, but the entire state. Uh, so, as Josh, our executive director, mentioned earlier today at the keynote. Um, we, uh, the state finally got a budget last year and we received a 30% uh, increase, but it's really 30% towards where we used to be uh, prior to that. And prior to that, we were in the two thirds uh, area. Um, so how many of you receive funding from earned income? Okay, and can each of you tell us what percentage is earned income, what percentage is uh, grant income? Don't know exact percentages. I know earned income used to be much more. Um, and what happened essentially in the 90s when the National Endowment for the Arts was slashed, it hurt everybody, but it hurt rural arts organizations, I think especially, because we don't have the local wealth that a lot of urban organizations do. And Roadside Theater, um, made a lot of our income through touring. Well, we weren't the only one to get our budgets cut. All the organizations that hosted us on tours got, our, got their budgets cut so that that market fell apart. And so now I don't know the percentages, but I know about two thirds of Apple Shop's income is from private philanthropy. And that's something we recognize is not a percentage that we want to continue and that we find to be particularly healthy. <clears throat> so. I'm just going to say project specific here. As far as the Plaza project, um, it is primarily uh, private um, funded. Um, so uh, one sixth of it um, has been public um, and then um, the rest has been uh, private. We do expect that to change as we um, as we move forward in our uh, f funding of it. Um, it. And you had mentioned that it was, timing was part of it, so the, the moon was aligned when the, your project took absolutely. off in some ways. Yeah, but we do expect, uh, we do expect quite a bit of um, foundation money to come into play, um, and some more um, municipality uh, money as well. Um, our in earned income, I think, is around 25%. All the classes and the workshops uh, our, our, our earned income source for the detour, but we also, people pay to be on the map if they're, on, if they're earning money, stores, or um, um, certain um, stops on the map pay to be on the map. Um, I would say for our site in general, um, we, our earned income is about um, close to 75% of what keeps our site going. For the Unlock program, um, however, it was, our earned income was very low on that. It was, um, if, if any, on that program in particular. So it really was, that entire program was funded through, um, through the grant and then through support from our, our municipality and through our, uh, through our own budget as well. Any, any more finance questions out there? Okay, we have one right here. Yes, um, but we're, you know, we're in a really kind of a unique situation where we're a historic site and we're an adaptive reuse site. So our first floor, we have a tenant and, um, you know, that tenant is really what enables us to continue having um, program operations. So we have a very successful restaurant on our first floor. Um, so that really is, is how we're able to do that. We also have a, a, an endowment that comes. I'm not counting that as, a, as earned income, but um, our tenant in the building really keeps us going. Okay, I have another question. We're moving away from finance now. What are some of the unexpected challenges that you found in, in your creative making projects? Yeah, go ahead. 
Okay, so partnerships change, um, and this is a real challenge that we're facing right now because I spoke a little bit before about how all of these groups were coming together at this perfect kind of moment in time to uh, make changes in our city. Well, we were all really successful, um, and one of the results, uh, one of the biggest results of those changes is we have a new form of city government, um, and our CVB is now gone, and in, st in its place we have um, a collaborative group um, to, and it was, it's good, it's all good. Um, they, they created this group to decrease redundancies and better use city money and so forth, but what has happened as a result is our partners that we were working with on the Plaza Project are, are um, some, some of them are gone um, completely and then others have changed and and so really I'm in this position now of um, kind of recreating a lot of those partnerships. Anyone else? Oh, sometimes it's the little things that surprise you. Um, so this, this event has been fairly successful. It's been growing every year. And so the, the food chain vendors, they're one of the ones that pay for a map stop uh, because we um, promote, promote it heavily and they come to them. And they sometimes become really territorial. So, <laughs> so as the event grows, it's like the, the chocolate vendor won't allow another chocolate vendor to be there. And, and it gets really emotional. And so it's not like we prepared in advance for this sort of thing. So now we, we have to. I've got a story connected to that, which is, yeah, as you know, working with these small community organizations, as they develop their strength and their ability to work at a higher level, it's sometimes, okay, so a community center that never got a grant before, and so now they can imagine this, this project and want to do that, but don't necessarily know all the, all the steps that a staffed nonprofit can take to get a federal grant, and so it's like, how much do you want to, do you, a bigger organization, want to help them, but when does that become paternalistic, um, and how to navigate essentially growing pains. Because um, if you're doing working with grassroots partners um, and they are growing in the ways you want them to be, there's going to be those growing pains. And one in particular I didn't, I was not prepared for was I knew it would be a challenge to build trust, you know, being who I am, working in the place where I was. Turns out that happened within six to 12 months, you know, if you do it right and really invest in relationships. The hardest thing is it's so easy for trust to turn into dependence. And it's like, no, no, y'all can do this. You don't need me. Oh, need, no, you don't need me. Um, you really, really don't. And it's, it's harder, especially in places with long histories of exploitation. How do people learn to trust themselves and each other? Just real quick to add to that, because that's so true, is um, in our community, um, a lot of time, I mean, we're the only arts agency, visual arts agency around. And so when anything artistic um, people want made, they turn to us first, which is great. We want to be seen as a resource, but at some point, too, you need to help them you know, know and, and realize that they, they too can do these things. Like we've done a couple of murals now in our community and they were wonderful. But now we're approached more and more often, do more murals, we want a mural. And then now we've, we've been able to make this switch and, 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 and be more in a supportive role as far as helping them do their own mural that they want. Um, and the first one was just completed that we did not do, and so I'm very happy that that's happening. So all of your projects have been fairly successful. There are different points in terms of uh, being stabilized or, uh, you know, being, um, yeah, stabilized. I imagine that you get approached by artists or other entities that think, hey, we do that too, we want to be part of what you're doing, or we want to come into town and be the other part, the other aspect that you're not doing. How do you handle those situations, or have you had those situations come up? This is when it's real nice to have a base of, you know, 18 to 20 community-based organizations that meet on a monthly basis, and sometimes sooner, which is, all right, cool, come to our meeting. 
tell us what you want to do. And they'll tell you very clearly whether that's in their self-interest or not, and they want to put resources into that or not. And so by building these kind of partnerships when they're actually equitable, we absolve ourselves as one institution as of the responsibility of being the arbiter of what good work is or not because there's this space that comes in and then that's the decision. So you let the mob Say again? Them. You let the mob take care of that. Mob action. <laughs> A mob suggests that they're not organized and they're not coordinated. Um, and that's I, I know it was a joke, but it's actually important because this I think there is this fear among those of us working in nonprofit organizations that oh God, if we don't keep everything under control, the mob is going to do whatever they're going to do. And it's like that's why you build relationships and you build relationships where people are actually at. And of course, you know, you, we wouldn't have that meeting without having you know, one-to-one -one relational meetings, you know, with leaders and, and, and chair and stuff in advance. So it's not mob action. It's actually organized democratic community action. Sorry for no sense of humor. No, that's, that's a good cover. But you still alleviate yourself from making the decision. For me, yeah, I don't think that we should be, that any nonprofit should be the arbiter of what a community does or does not want. Donna? Um. Uh, some interesting things have happened recently that we did not expect, but we are very happy about. Uh, as, as we shifted the detour to a biennial, we took off a year to figure that out. But we had an NEA grant that we wrote the year before, not knowing we were going to be shifting to the biennial. So we needed to write back to the NEA and tell them what we were doing and see if we could somehow keep that grant. And so we had this transition year where we stayed very, very active and visible during the transition so people didn't think we were going away. Well, during that year, we didn't do the detour. Another tour sprung up called the Hill and Valley Exploration Tour. It was the farmers and the landowners who had benefited by several years of the detour that said, wait a minute, and so they formed their own tour. And this year, we did them together, and that is wonderful. There was no collaboration. They did their thing, we did our thing, we were secretly applauding but we didn't want to mess with it because they were doing their thing. Um, I think ultimately it would be a good idea for us to um, I don't know, be on the same page, but we promoted them in our detour map. They bought an offshoot stop so because they could take advantage of our publicity. Um, so sometimes things happen without necessarily a plan or necessarily a venue for that kind of uh, conversation. I think one of the things that has been extraordinarily helpful for me as the director of the Gaylord Building is um, we have a really strong st strategic plan. And we worked with um, you know my board of directors and we really brainstormed on what direction they wanted to see our organization go. And so we may have had a list that had you know a hundred items of things they would like to see happening at our site. And so we were able to narrow it down and, and create some a, a very strong mission and as well as some imperatives of what we were hoping to accomplish in the next three to five years. And so when people approach us to, hey, this was great, you know what you need to do next, if it's not falling within our strategic imperatives, I can you know, roll that out, and it, it, it isn't as if we're turning people away or a good idea away, but we're saying, I'm gonna make a note of this for when we go back to the table for planning again, um, this will be something that we can all consider as a group. But you know, we have a, a really very, very small staff and of course limited resources, and so um, as much enthusiasm as there is, and I love that, we can only accomplish so much and do it well. Any other questions out there? One here. Yes. Yes. We sort of did a mini little detour in City Park in Reedsburg and did a series of what we called test plots um, leading up to it. So yes, and they were happy. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I can take a little bit of that. Um, we um, like to think of our event as being welcome to everyone. And so overtly political art, we would probably 
um, because it's site responsive and, and welcoming, um, we, the jury may not select. However, there are plenty of issues that could be political that artists do address in their work that can either be perceived or not perceived. So we've had a couple of artists that have dealt with carbon sequestration and um, uh, global climate change issues, but you can appreciate the work on a variety of levels, and that's one of the levels. Um, I put up a slide behind me, too, um, that illustrates kind of one of these um, kind of bumps in the road that we had to address. Um, and, you know, we haven't done, we hadn't done a lot of these public art arts projects up to this point, so a lot of it was a learning curve. But this mural in particular was executed by um, an artist in residence that we had hired, and um, her style just happens to be um, a lot more kind of the, the street art style or graffiti art style. And so we had some very interesting challenges with this um, from um, mostly our city um, government um, threw up some roadblocks initially about um, they all of a sudden wanted to um, put up some very real limitations as to what kind of murals we can do. Um, and we were, luckily, we were able to work through those. Um, and it was mostly because of community people um, that kind of took up for it on our behalf. And so I really didn't end up having to really um, take, take it too far before the city changed their mind on their potential policies. <laughs> we, got, we got a call recently uh, from somebody listening to our community radio station that didn't like one of the DJs was uh, saying something bad about Trump. And the guy, Aaron, Eric, who picked up the phone at the Apple shop says, tune in tomorrow morning. Old Red will be on and he'll be making fun of Al Gore. <laughs> this is the way that we always deal with it is we make a space for everybody and make sure that everybody's voice is welcome. And so we do a story circle and we tell people that somebody else might tell a story that offends you. And that's okay. That is no more and no less than that person's story. And when it gets around to you, you are welcome to tell a story that provides a different perspective on that same thing. And that person is gonna have to sit there, shut up and listen to you, just like you sat there, shut up and listen to them. Any other last questions? Okay, um, do you have any last uh, words of wisdom to impart on our uh, audience in terms of creative placemaking? I have one thing to add. Um, I don't know about my other uh, rural and small town friends, but there has been an enormous amount of attention being paid to positive things that are happening in rural areas post uh, 2016 election. Um, and so I think that, that the country looked at the map of the U.S. and said maybe we should pay attention. So they're paying attention to the Midwest, they're paying attention to rural areas, and I think that this is the time to tell positive, uh, welcoming stories, and I think, um, um, in fact, we're going to be featured on the PBS NewsHour coming up soon, as Apple Shop was. So I think that this is a moment to seize. When I do long presentations, I put up a map, an electoral map of 2016, not state by state the way you usually see it, but county by county. And you see there is no red states or blue states. There is urban and rural. And it is easy, some people say, oh, okay, well clearly the good guys live in the cities and the bad guys live in rural. And you ever go to a rural area and you realize that's not the case. And it's a matter of disinvestment. It's a matter of when there is no opportunity for people to express themselves, tell their stories. And the only thing that you get is Fox News and Christian Right Radio, then that's the story people are gonna hear, that's the story people are gonna tell, and that's the story people are gonna live. And so you invest in opportunities for people, all people, left, right, center, you know, whatever, to tell their stories, to share their stories, and to create something that together, that is how democracy comes. Ben, Jessica, Pam, Donna, thank you. Please uh, give a warm thank you to our panel today.
Thank you. Uh, just a programming note, uh, the, right now we're going to be in the passing uh, time, time period, but there are...